up the phonograph. But something is also happening in Zimbabwe uh, in the early 80s, right? Uh, in 1983, to be specific, uh, Zimbabwe is, is about three years old. It's at war with itself for a lot of reasons, right? But something is happening and it's, 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 it's exciting, especially for urban youths yes. uh, and people who were just progressive at the time to want to experience what this new Zimbabwe had to offer, right? Uh, that thing is a radio station called Radio 3. <laughs> there, 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 is, there is some rich history that comes with Radio 3 and its positioning. And, and, and maybe you could speak on that for a bit. So, our broadcasting system had been inherited from the British because, you know, we were colonized by the British. And when I was young, having wanted to experience all kinds of, of things in the world, you know, like I said, started working at an early age, uh, wanting to access the UK at an early age, wanting to learn, wanting to gather information, wanting to empower myself to, to, to improve my capacity. Um, radio was, and still is, one of the most powerful products in the world. Communication is power. God was the first DJ. In order for creation to happen, he spoke. <laughs> and you know, he loves music, you know? And so, so he was a speaker, he was an orator, he was a broadcaster. Uh, and, and the music, uh, music radio as we know it, uh, takes elements of creativity. It, it, ta it takes elements of, of godliness. Huh? And it's important that I, I mention this because what people hear and see, they believe. When Zimbabwe inherited a broadcasting system from the then Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporation and Radio 3. How many came, radio stations were there before Radio 3 came around? There were, there were three stations. There, there, there was the, the English service, there was the vernacular service, which later on became Radio 2. And I think at that time there was also a, a radio station um, for education. I mean, people used to, to receive school via radio. Uh, some of it has started to happen again uh, today because of COVID. And what they then did is, is when, when the broadcasters who represented Zimbabwe, who represented the struggle, your, your former Minister Shamus, Webster Shamu, they were broadcasters during the struggle in what was called Radio Mozambique. Radio Mozambique was an effective tool within the struggle because it brought the information that Zimbabweans needed in order to keep abreast with the struggle. So when, when we then uh, were given the ability to speak with the nation, then the other radio stations were born. There was Radio 1, Radio 2, Radio 3, uh, Radio 4. And at the time, what is interesting is, is the Zimbabwean listener was hungry for a Zimbabwean product. Zimbabwean products included Zimbabwean history, Zimbabwean stories, Zimbabwean uh, music and Zimbabwean stars. Now, the stars that we began to celebrate were all parts and parcel of radio. Radio 2 would broadcast sport, soccer live. You had your Evans Bambaras, mm. who were prolific broadcasters. Um, radio 1 was still uh, uh, an apathy, uh, you know, high income group setup where it only broadcast in English. Uh, and still spoke to and still spoke the very white, it, to, to the very existing white, white yes, market. Uh, market yeah. yeah. And then what they then decided to do, you know, is they wanted to start to educate 
guys who had started to begin to urbanize, coming out from um, Kunana Chuesh, eh? Kunana Murambinda, Bachuyam Town. Is it true that there was actually a drive to get more people to come to urban areas? Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Why, why was that? The, the reason why they needed that is because Zimbabweans had now started to take over industry. Um, and very similar to what was happening in South Africa, I don't know if you know of the Wenera uh, mm -hmm. era, where the mining uh, industry in South Africa required a lot of manpower, and they reached out to, to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Southern Rhodesia, 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 so the boys hands over my rural areas, man. Just open up tunnels, you know. And and one of the things they they use in order to gather the information that they needed was radio. TV sets were one or two in in two or three marine. Do you know what I mean? And remember, they were still were quite big, black and white, and only the people who had a specific position in. In, 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 in hierarchies at work could afford a black and white TV. Right. So, so we'd go and gather. Murain <laughs> one, Kumbaga Blaz, who is a manager at Delta or something, in order for us to see television. Mm -hmm. So the mode of communication then was radio. Radios at that time had, had, had become mobile units as well. You could put a certain type of battery in a mobile um, a radio it was, it was set. A I, I remember even back in the rural areas, someone, Arpo uh, Basco, on a bike, and by the carrier, they used to have a radio they, seat listening are, to the radio. This is it, yes. listen to the radio. Mm -hmm. and, and radio became such a powerful communication tool. Uh, to a point, it educated, it empowered, it drove, it, it uh, demystified um, urbanization for people who are now moving, the migration from rural dwellings to urban cities. Now with that, stars were born. I remember when we were young, having come from Highfields, that's where people would gather for live events. You know, Leonard Dembos, your Bundu boys, and if, if, if it was Christmas, if it was, um, Easter, you know, all the big calendrical events would go to Gwanzura Stadium. And, and performances would happen there. Yeah? It's about six to six. <laughs> Who are some of the big stars at the time? Big stars at the time, the Bundu boys. Tuku was, was big, not as big. Mukanya. Tuku's greatest competition was Mukanya. Mukanya would come blow the place up. Dance all night by the speaker, you know. <laughs> what, about, what about your uh, Simon Chimbetu and the Marxist brothers, when they were still called the Marxist brothers at the time, were they, were they big? Simon Chimbetu, Marxist brothers, they had found a specific niche. They were really huge in, in most rural settings, in places where, um, where, you know, mining communities were. They were bigger in those places than they were in, in urban Areas. What about your James Chimombe? James Chimombe, yeah, they, 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 they were the boys. I mean, Anna, Anna Leonard, uh, Jacate as well at the time, you know, him wanting to, to, to be one of the greatest exports, dancing and looking like Michael Jackson. So, so really, the, the boys were starting to become stars. Um, I did mention the Bundu boys who one of the, were at the time one of the greatest exports. Do you know what I mean? I remember watching BBC and they were on BBC Live and that kind of thing, and we were thinking, how did they make it? Do you know, how did when they go overseas? Like they, they were rock stars. They were rock stars. Um, rock stars also came from television. TV was the all in all of stardom. We had. Uh, 
news base at the time. Uh, we had Anam Joe Madimba. Mm -hmm. you know? Joseph Madimba. Joseph, yeah, yeah. Joseph, Joseph Madimba, Madimba was, was quite a Joseph, rock star. Yeah, he was a rock star. With a, with a booming with a, voice. With a booming voice. Um, and, and television what was, was multiracial. What was showing on television? What was the programming like? Most of the programming was imported. Uh, I, I remember that they, they had a share arrangement with productions from the UK. But for local productions, Anambuyam Lam were examples. Mutiro Wafanza. Mutiro especially Mukadota. Because those were actually produced by the broadcaster. By, by the broadcaster. By yeah, the yeah, national yeah, broadcaster. Yeah. And Aparafin, right. things like that. And, and, and that was the source of entertainment. That was the source of information. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. <laughs> None of these social media handles were available. Right. So if you were a powerful enough brand and people saw you on television, heard you on radio, read about you in the newspaper, you became a star. Um, was, was, was television open uh, to the black folk? Uh, back in colonial Rhodesia, were there any black faces we could see on television? People could see on television. In, in the beginning, we, we didn't have as many. Uh, I then learned as I progressed in my industry that some of the people that had really made Rhodesia Broadcasting Corporations, I then later met them in life, or in, uh, uh, they were integrated in my growth in the things that I learned in terms of broadcasting. Uh, Martin Locke, um, who I, I worked with briefly in, in South Africa and in the UK. Um, he was black? White. He was white. They, yeah, okay. these are former white broadcasters who, because of the changes that were happening in Zimbabwe, then crossed the border and went and started applying their, um, their trade in South Africa. Uh, Keith Lindsay, who also became my boss at a time uh, and he was a director and, and a very formidable force at SABC. He was a former Rhodesian broadcaster and I learned a lot from him and I still have a relationship with him today. And, and so what then happened is, is when this crew then went to South Africa and some of them even went back into the UK, then young Zimbabwean stars were starting to rise. So John Martinez. No, no, no. Take me back to the formation uh, of Radio 3. What was the mindset in creating the machine or the, the radio station, should I say, that is Radio 3? The thinking at that time, I remember having a conversation with some of the directors uh, when I was a really young man and they were just telling me about what they were planning to achieve with a service such as Radio 3. They said that we wanted for black Zimbabweans to start to believe in themselves. Pop culture had been predominantly driven by white people. Even the music was very white then. Black people only started piercing that veil through protest music. Examples are hip hop. Hip hop is derived from black poetry. Yeah? When black people started gathering together and expressing themselves, they would speak like you do. You're a poet. Mm. They would speak, they would have places and, and arenas where they would gather together and share poems. Poetry became a, a, a large tool in order to, to, to share views, share visions, and even create hope for others. Then they provided a beat to it, and that's how rap music came to life. If you see how music graduated, especially in the States, when slavery uh, first began, black people, as they, as they toiled under white supremacy, in order for them to get a sense of, of belonging, a sense of humanity, they sang. You know, your amazing grace, you know, it's, it's stuff that then even went into church, but these were black folk songs. And they represented uh, a yearning, they represented um, a hope, they represented a sense of, of liberty, of personal freedom, 
of humanity for what it's worth. And then jazz came out of that movement because black people were starting to use, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, American at that time or, or British uh, instrumentation in order to, to create a vibe and a dance. And outside of that, R&B took elements of jazz and of, of, of the gospel drive, and then we started singing about, about socialization, about love, you know, about coming together, about partying, about celebrating. And then that brought the rise to R&B or the music that we know today. So, so, so it is interesting to see how cultures develop. Pop music, as I said, uh, for a time was created in order to, to bring in black people into a certain kind of pros, uh, thought process. But later on in, in life, at the time when hip hop was born, it was a banned genre of music in, in a lot of um, white owned broadcasting institutions because it represented anger the Black Panther movement in the States, uh, uh, black human rights, your, your Martin Luther Kings were sampled in hip hop music, you know? And, and, and that became a force to reckon with. Then when people realized that hip hop music was not going anywhere, they then thought, ah, okay, why don't we take elements of hip hop music and then bring it into pop culture? Then you got your Sugar Hill Gang, you got your Curtis Blow, you know. They started uh, um, singing about parties, singing about, about the black aspirations of becoming basketball sporting stars, you know. Some of the, the music they sang about and the things that they, they, they brought into music at that time was, you know, talking about color TVs, talking about wearing nice clothes, driving cars, champagne, so what, did, what, what was the sound of Radio 3 whilst you're just in, in the avenue of music and pop culture at the time? Uh, because, because anyone who speaks of Radio 3, they seem to remember uh, a lot about the music, the personalities. They say they had a vibe to it. Uh, they say that Radio 3 was, at a certain point, uh, the mecca yes. of, of urban Without radio in Africa. In Africa. Yes, indeed. So, indeed. so oh, t take me through the journey, the the metamorphosis that Radio Three is going through from formation. Who are some of the early stars who start to permeate yeah. uh, and, and sort of like shine through yeah. and become what is known? Who who make the personality of what is Radio Three? Yeah. At the time, remember you spoke earlier on about about the grouping of Southern African countries, and we're part of uh, Nyasaland. And, and in, in so doing, Zimbabwe has always st stood as a leading uh, society uh, and as a leading country within the region, within the South African region. So, so when Radio 3 was born, other surrounding countries, your Malawi, your Zambia, Mozambique, uh, your South Africa, your Botswana, had not even started thinking about radio stations. But yes, yet I said, radio was, and still is to a point, one of the most powerful communication tools. So the thinking, I remember uh, my former boss, Great Jatonga, who's now an ambassador, uh, I, I sat with him in, in a lot of meetings and I discussed what they were trying to achieve and they were talking about urbanization, about changing the culture, changing the faces that people saw. When people saw David Bowie as a white person, when they saw uh, the Beatles as a white band, when they saw, uh, even on television, your Days of Our Lives, your um, Dynasty, these were white faces, white stories. And in order for people to start to believe them in themselves, they needed to see themselves in the stories, okay? You mentioned Mugadota. Mugadota became a, an immediate hit. 
because people saw themselves in the stories. People saw their families. They, they saw their families. Yeah, people. They saw, they saw the, 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 the uncle who had been to, to, to the UK or for two paraffin days, or, or paraffin or whatever it is, yeah. and they could relate. So when, when Radio 3 was born, your, um, your young, hungry for success broadcasters, your John Martindes, your Caleb Tonelanders, my mentor, Josh McCower. Yes, these, were, these were the young boys who understood what it meant to lead a movement, to represent a nation, to, to represent the aspirations of urbanization and African pop culture. What made this, the, the, these people you've mentioned, along with the many other great radio personalities who made up what became known as Radio 3 in the early years, uh, especially in the 80s, uh, what, what made them just stand out? What, what made them so great? What kind of music were they playing? What was the culture uh, that they were transmitting through the radio set? What was the energy? What made them... Uh, what made you want to listen to them and think, whoa, I, I, I want to I wanna be like this? Uh, what, what type of picture were they painting as painters at the time who were just doing it through the radio set? So profound. That is, that is an, a very, very fundamental question in that it speaks to how the urban culture um, became who we are today. Those young people started to bring closer to black people the issues that black uh, African natives, wherever they were, whether in the States, whether in the UK, whether in Europe, would, would relate to. Um, wanting to improve personal surroundings and settings. It was in the music wanting to, to become football or rugby stars. It was in the music. Wanting to, to be recognized for who we are. It was in the music. The language. The language. It was in the music. The style, the fashion was in the music. Where to hang out. Where to hang out was in the music. So, so Radio 3 shaped uh, a lot of what urban Zimbabwe yes. became. Yes, yes, yes. Your, your, your success stories in the, in the names that I've mentioned. John Martinde, fashionista, brand new suit every day. Eh? Killing, Killing it. Killing it. Driving sports cars. Eh? Two then, doors. Then. 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 What? I'm telling you, in the 80s. I remember I, I met with, uh, he was my boss, by the way, John Martinde, still very close. Uh, good brother of mine. He bought... It must have been a Mazda or something, a two-door. And, and he came, drove into a parking lot, and as young people, one of the things, if you wanted to grow in the business, you'd rush to a brother's car and carry the records. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and to carry the bag with the records. Um, and I remember saying to him, wow, this car. He says, no, I just bought it. I mean, I, mean, I needed to, to have smart wheels, young man. And uh, I or just- smart wheels. Yeah, smart wheels, young man. And just, as you can see, it's, it's, it's two doors. Yeah. This is not a family car. This is for me and my plus one. <laughs> <laughs> just my car was similar. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing you mentioned the idea that uh, you went and carried records, mm -hmm. which means a lot of um, what gave Radio 3 flavor was the idea that there was the, 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 the DJs, yeah. disc jockeys at the time, the personalities, could add in their flavor. Because music was very hard to access yeah. at the yeah. time. Yeah. So the only t time people could actually access certain type of music or hear a certain song is when a certain DJ came on because that DJ had the music. And there was a lot of buying of music from the UK, yes. from people who were outside, yes. And, yes. and the culture was starting to, yes. to, yes. to really come yes. together. For, for people who understand radio, and I want to mention this, so one of the biggest influences of radio was WBLS. Right. WBLS was a black station uh, in America, 
at a time when, as I was saying, the, bob, the pop culture was predominantly white. Mm -hmm. So they were the ones that started playing uh, what therefore became progressive urban music with elements of house music, elements of hip hop, elements of jazz, your Ella Fitzgeralds, you know, all that came from WBLS. A lot of the black, African black radio greats I know, they tell a story that uh, a lot of them listen to a cassette tape uh, that was WBLS. Uh, I for one. Uh, people learned how to mix from listening, from, from to, listening to WBLS. WBLS. People yes. learned what radio could sound like from WBLS. WBLS. Yeah. And, and WBLS and wherever you are guys, you made us who we are. WBLS understood one thing. They realized for, for a certain vibe to be appreciated, it needed to be authentic. Because what had started happening is white radio presenters were trying to play black music, but they would not connect with some of the messages. Mm -hmm. So what WBLS said is they got the superstars from the ghettos. Put them on from, radio. Put them on radio. Spoke like the spoke people. Spoke like the people. Heard like the people. Related information their about the neighborhood. I'm telling you. Authentically. Authentic they knew authentication. what to play, when to play it, and how to play it for the people in the hood to appreciate it. And that's what made WBLS uh, the mecca of uh, black radio. Yes. In the same way uh, Radio 3 became the mecca of black radio then. So similarly, when Radio 3 came onto the scene, at the time we spoke about the radio, the device that would, would access um, signals or frequencies from Zimbabwe. So if you were in Botswana, on shortwave, okay, you could still catch Radio 3. Get out of here. Yes. If you were in South Africa, in, in the bordering... The Limpopo area. Yeah, the Limpopo area, you could catch Radio 3. If you were in Zambia, you could catch Radio 3. If you were in Malawi, you could catch Radio 3. So if you are in Mozambique... You could catch Radio 3. So it was a regional it station. It was a regional station. That's why, out of South Africa, your DJ Freshes tell you that if it wasn't for Radio 3, he'd not be the man that he is today. So, uh, how did you find yourself uh, on Radio 3 in 1988? Because at the time, radio was such a closed industry. Yeah. You don't just walk up and become a no radio ways. personality. No it was such a closed industry. And a lot, there was a lot ZBC of... ZBC was, was like you working for Google. <laughs> it was that bad. It was that bad. People would, would literally fight to access the ZBC campus to meet and dine with the superstars there because we had uh, um, uh, a five-star restaurant and delivery system in the 80s. And, and so it was an iconic place. And because of that, only the best of the best would get a, a chance at, at broadcasting. So that's why the quality of talent was, was, exactly. was, was on point. Yeah. So, so how did you get on to radio? You had to know somebody. <laughs> <laughs> My story is interesting. I am from Eiffels. In Eiffels, one of the major stars Eiffels has ever, ever created is the late, great Josh Macau. Josh Makawa was my hero, he was my mentor, he was my good friend, he was my brother. And Josh Makawa lived Kuserwira in Gwim. So as a young boy, whenever Josh was going to play or to make appearances, I was a big blast. I was a big blast. Yeah, a big, it's a common story. <laughs> it is a common story. That is the apprenticeship of the business. I was a big so they, they talk about uh, the late, great Josh Makawa Beger. And, and with that, he imparted something. He, he taught me a lot about the industry, uh, about behaving as a superstar. Josh Makawa was an interesting character in that he knew the power that 
he could conjure. And so, one of the first people to, to go beyond just being a broadcaster, he was a businessman. There was Josh and Kathy, it was a fashion house in the city. And remember, the city then was predominantly white. Right. And Josh Makanga and his shop blast. <laughs> Mtona is right in the right in the center of huh? the city. Of the city. Get out of here. First Street. First Street was almost a no-go area for black people. Josh Macau said, Josh Macau would change five times a day, dude. <laughs> <laughs> but why? Because he can. Because he can. Um, so Josh and Kether became a very successful enterprise. Josh Makawa then, something that I learned from him was an ability to transcend different parts of broadcasting. Television, radio, uh, in front of camera, behind the camera. You've got to learn and understand. As we speak, as we do the things that we're doing, you've got to understand what the cameraman is trying to achieve. You've got to understand the thought process of the producer. Why? It makes you a better present. Because you're not just presenting for yourself. In the back of your mind, you understand what is happening behind the scenes. So it sharpens you. And he's the man who taught me that. And besides that, he taught me how to act in public, how to interact with your fans. He says, you know, you may not know the person who sees or hears you, but they know you because you're in their house every day. You're on their TV set every day. The things that we're talking about, they are listening, they are watching. So they know. So when somebody approaches you and says, hey, so profound, no, don't give them a cold shoulder. Because you're the one who got into their private place and space in the first place. So you've got to be able to understand that, that they are stakeholders of your success. In your business. In your business. Do you know what I mean? Right. When it's time to fight for your brand, who'll fight for it? Not you. They'll fight for it. They'll fight for it. Sure. So, so you're carrying Josh Makawa's uh, uh, a vinyl, a bag of vinyl. <laughs> yeah. Right, because at the time people were playing vinyls. Yeah. Right? So, because everything is very analog yes. at the time. Yes, yes. Uh, so how did you get on radio, Titch? I, I started visiting Josh while he was doing what he's doing on the radio station. And so do I, I, I met other prolific broadcasters, as I mentioned, your Josh Makawas, your Musikumalas, um, your Peter Joneses, your Kuzima Rudzes. As a young, I was a little boy, you know, I was still a teenager. And, and, and then I realized in order for me to access this that I want to do, that I would like to achieve, I needed to be part and parcel of the system, the ecosystem at ZBC. The only job available at the time was floor management. Do you know what that is? No. Can I put a gaffer? No, it's a chichinon's gaffer. Gaffer, I'm not going to broadcasting. I'm not going to try to get my cables. I'm not going to try to get my studio. In the studio. After we're done, Pana Blaza, Ruxeru Garunzi, Gaffa, Krauti, floor manager, we're done. They then set up the place, put things away. That's my other job at ZBC. Then I graduated from being a floor manager. I then learned how to do sound, so I can do sound. I then learned how to do camera, so I can do camera. I then learned how to produce, so I can produce. And also, so was this an official gig or at the this time was you an were interning? This the, I was interning, then it became an official gig. Um, I had a lot of interest in, in, in pleasing my parents and becoming a doctor. Uh, I was good at sciences at school. So, Same here, we have a similar part. Yeah, and at one time I really wanted to become a biochemist. Uh, but I am blessed. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you're, you, you're, you're occupying these different spaces at ZBC. Yeah. How do you find yourself in front of the mic? I, so I, I would go and work at the television side, and when it's lunchtime, I'd cross over to the radio side. 
I would, I would see producers like, at the time, Kuzimaruza. They would teach me how the system works and that kind of thing. He was also a librarian. Um, so I started meeting people. Uh, and one day, I just finished doing production at, at, at television, over the television side. I went over to radio. And the person who was meant to take over who was the that show, person? I think it was Elvis, Elvis Chimene, was running late. Which time slot is this? This was in the afternoon, I think 12 till 3. And it must have been, Kuzima Ruza then came out and saw me and said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. He says, would you like to stand in and just play music until uh, Elvis arrives? I said, yeah, cool, 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 cool. So I, I get into the studio, remember, my mandate was to play music and not say anything. Right. <laughs> so they give me the records, okay. He should be here in 45 minutes, so just play music. Don't say anything. Huh? So what does Titch Patais do? Tell me Titch Patais. <laughs> Titch Patais gets in there and doesn't say anything. <laughs> no, no, no. Titch Patais gets in, plays two songs and says, Hi, my name is Titch Patais. <laughs> <laughs> I'm standing in. <laughs> for, for, Elvis. For, for Elvis. He's on his way, but I hope you like me. <laughs> And so the story goes. Right. You are one of the youngest voices to be on yes. Radio 3. I was still a teenager, yeah. Still a teenager? Yeah. Uh, at the time, 19. 19. To be specific, yeah. 1988. Yeah. And, and you just became one of those dudes. Yeah. So walk me from your first day at work. Elvis is running late. Mm. What did the bosses say? I think my bosses at the time, because they listened, and because he comes back in, I think, and he says, okay, okay, carry on, carry on, carry on. Uh, I do a show. I eventually did the complete show, because uh, he was not able to make it. And then the next day, they call me into the office. And I'm shaking. I'm like, dude, I'm going to get fired. <laughs> you get into the office. Who's uh, the boss at the time? The boss was Musi Kumala at the time. Right. And Musi Kumala then sits me down and says, oh, we like what you did. Uh, however, don't ever do that again. <laughs> <laughs> if you try that stunt ever again, you're out. So we're going to give you a shift, midnight shift. So traditionally, the midnight shift on radio is the training ground. Right. Graveyard. The graveyard. Graveyard. Call it the graveyard shift. 12 till but 3. But at the time, radio used to close. Yes, yes. At the time, they used to close. But what had happened is they were the first to start to broadcast for 24 hours. I remember Rumbi Kati had been telling me a, a story of her being on the graveyard shift. Yes, yeah. A and she was shocked that people would listen to the radio yes, at the time. Yes, yes, yes. And, and that service, for the very first time, people would, would access music and information, you know, after hours. Remember, television used to start at... Six, five, 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 five in the morning yeah. and close around 11. Yes, yes. It started five in the afternoon and close about 11. Mm -hmm. And then they'd show you the, the color bus. The color bus. <laughs> so but next day. switch to radio sometimes. Yes, uh, yes, at a certain point yes. It's a, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so we were possibly one of the first radio stations as Radio 3 to go 24 hours. And with that, we were able to train uh, from 12 until 3 or 3 until 6 o'clock. Um, so you get given 3, uh, you, you get 3 or 6, uh, midnight to 3. Yeah. And, and you, you ride with it. I ride with For it. For how long? I probably did about 3 months. 3 months? Yeah. Thereafter, I remember the, them calling me back in saying, listen, you're a young man. Are you going back to school? What do you want to do? Do you, do you want a gig? And I, and I thought to myself, at the time, I was starting to study at the university, biochemistry. Because I could afford to go to university during the day, and then uh, at night, I'd be on radio, mm -hmm. you know? Then I thought to myself, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So I, sh I chose the microphone. 
Uh, which instead which, of the microscope. <laughs> <laughs> which shift did they give you uh, after that? After that, they gave me the night shift for about six months. Then after the night shift, they gave me the 12 to 3 go go time. Go go time with Tish Matas. Tish Matas. Which would later change your life. Yes. Uh, go go time with Tish Matas. Yes. So, uh, Tish, from 1988 to about 91. Right, you are not only training, but you are you're becoming one of the household names yeah. in Zimbabwe. Right, uh, you're doing 12 to 3, which is like a prime yeah. slot. Yeah. It's it, just one of the greatest radio stations in in in, in Southern Africa. In Southern really. Africa, but you get an interesting call whilst you're on the radio from Tapelo Tipe. <laughs> <laughs>